Good morning, everyone. I'm Laura McCletty, and I'm one of the facilitators. For those that are on here for the first time, we'll let you let you introduce yourselves in just a second. And I'm one of the facilitators, along with uh, Mary Johnson, Jackie Edwards, Steve Johnson, uh, Winston Robinson, Natalie McAreth, and um, Saritha Cheryl and Carlina Ivory. We are the, the team, we're the team that work with the Tuesday morning breakfast and we'd like to welcome you here and we invite you to come back. We're together almost every Tuesday morning throughout the year to share information about um, things that are happening in Charlotte and particularly in the African-American community, but welcome. So well, I'll start with you, Shante. You wanna introduce yourself and just sure. tell us a little bit about who you're affiliated with or where you're working. Um, just take a few seconds and do that. Sure. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Shante Burke Hare, and <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. I will have to run around like nine fifteen because I have to get to court. But I'm I'm, a, I'm an attorney here in Charlotte. I practice in family law, estate planning, and probate, as well as juvenile law. Um, but I'm also running for district court judge here in Charlotte. I am. Um, running specifically for seat one, the seat that was previously held by the Honorable Kimberly Best. And so I'm so delighted to be here with you all. Um, I'll put some information in the chat, but I saw the topic for today, so I'm excited to hear it. Okay, thank you um, for coming. Do we have anyone else that's here for the first time? Okay, and that is... Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Susan Gang here. I'm the director for career and technical education uh, for CMS. Uh, glad to be here. Okay. Thanks for coming. Uh, we'd like to just share some information, uh, especially for you, you two that are here for the first time. What we ask you to do is to, if you have any questions, we have, pres we have presenters and the presenters will present. And after they present, if you have any questions, we ask you to enter them in the chat because we will be um, asking the questions. The facilitators usually ask the questions. The other thing that we want to share with you is that we do have candidates. Also, we have uh, some of our elected officials that are, are appointed and appointed uh, staff that may be online. And we at the end of our Tuesday forum, we usually allow them to introduce themselves and tell us what office they're running for. But, um, and we also like to start off with the word of prayer. Our person that usually uh, is with us is not with us this morning. So I'm gonna ask Jackie if she would lead us in a word of prayer this morning. Saritha Sherrill is that person she was not able to get on. Good Lord, morning, Lord. We're so happy to be here with you today. And also with those who are on the call we ask that the proceedings that we're about to go through with presentation come from She Built the City, that it be edifying to those who are on the call and knowledgeable so that we may be able to share the information. We thank you for your so many blessings. We ask that you just help us as we go along the way in the name of the soon coming King, amen. amen. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, we have with us this morning, we had announced that uh, the founder of She Built This City, Jenny Clark, will be here, but she's not, she's not available. So her, found, her executive director, Latoya Austin, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, uh, and I, I did get a message that she would be, I, I think she's on, I've seen her on, uh, but Miss Marion uh, Post, is also here as well from uh, She Built This City. So is, is Latoya available to speak at this time? I, I see your name. Yes. Are you okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. You, you've been here for a while. <laughs> Good okay. morning. Yes. Good morning. But <laughs> you, this, I, I'm turning it over to you now, Latoya. Wonderful. Um, well, good morning, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to, to be with you today. I see lots of familiar faces, Attorney Patterson, Mr. Crump, Mr. Thomas. 
Um, thank you for having me. It is an esteemed privilege and honor to be able to be a part of this forum today. Um, I am Latoya Foster, and I am the executive director of She Built This City. I'm here with my teammate, Marion Pulse. Um, she is our corporate partnerships manager. Um, as Ms. Laura noted, um, Demi, our founder, could not be here today, and she sends her um, regrets, but we will represent strong um, with what we're doing here in the local community. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here. And um, get started. Now, Mr. Steven, I know you, I probably should have talked to you before now. <laughs> I'm just going to share is it the entire screen. Uh, that, that's fine, or just the uh, browser that you're, uh, or the, the uh, software that you're using. Wonderful. Okay. Here we go. So, let me start with uh, who am I? <laughs> My name is Latoya Faustin. I'm born and raised in Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm to a single mother. Um, I went to Dudley High School. Um, and I often, when you say you're from Greensboro, you often get asked if you went to a and And so my answer is no, <laughs> I did not go to a and um, But going to Dudley, I felt like I had the HBCU experience already. <laughs> um, I'm a proud uh, Panther alum. Um, I went to Elon University post um, Dudley, um, then joined Teach for America and spent three years on the border of Texas and Mexico te teaching high school English. Um, I realized there um, that my heart was for community development. I knew that no matter what I did with inside, inside those four walls of the classroom, it wasn't going to impact them outside. And so if there's abject poverty outside of the classroom, you can get an A on this exam. You can make a five on your end of grade test. But if you don't have viable work solutions from the community, that A means nothing. And so I, I left the classroom in pursuit of what was next? I didn't know community development was a thing. I didn't know that was a way that you could empower communities. I just knew my students and their families needed more. Um, and I went in pursuit of that and um, a winding journey all around different places from faith based nonprofits to education based. I got my master's in business. Um, I find myself here at She Built This City. I'm fully emerged in understanding that the trades are a viable pathway to upward mobility in a, a needed conversation that we need to have, um, especially here in Charlotte, given our statistics. And so let's dig in, like, how are we going to make this happen? So it is our desire to see that this next generation of skilled trades workers are both diverse and infused with technology. How do we envision making that happen? So our mission is to provide industry disruptive programming that sparks interest and builds pathways to lucrative careers in the skilled trades. Um, for youth, women, and marginalized communities. We were founded by Demi in 2019 to impact women in the trades. Um, there is a distinct divide in equity in the trades, and herself, having been a woman in the industry for 20 years, got tired of being the only woman in the room. And so she founded this organization out of that passion to see that changed. Um, pandemic hit in 2020 and we quickly realized that we wanted to be of service to the community we wanted to help mothers who were looking for options um, but we didn't want to say you can bring your um, daughter but not your son <laughs> so very very quickly um, within the origin of our organization our mission broadened so it is not just women we serve youth we serve women and marginalized communities again realizing that this is a viable pathway for upward mobility. We did not want to exclude vulnerable populations. And we want to be industry disruptive because if we continue to do the same things that we've always done, what is the quote? You'll get what you've always gotten. And so we're trying to change things. And so our ways of engaging with the community and with the industry in particular, um, we're, we're changing things. And disruption sometimes met with a little bit of pushback, but that's nothing that we're not ready and prepared to overcome with our partners. What is our vision? We are trying to dismantle barriers and stigmas in traditionally male dominated industries through innovative, sustainable practices that prepare us for a future of jobs that have yet to be created. That's the key. I think so often in workforce development culture, we're talking about getting prepared for this career, that career. But let's take technology for a second. If you are studying coding and you go to a four year degree, in your sophomore year, you're taking a, a coding course, by the time you graduate, that tech, that information is obsolete. 
<laughs> the industries are moving so fast that it's hard for traditional ways of education to keep up with um, this path. And so we're trying to prepare the thinker, the innovator of the future for the job description that hasn't even been written yet. How do we do that? I like to say that we are a workforce development organization that understands that career decisions are made early. Because they are made early, we start early with hands-on instructions. There's the statistic that reads that if a young girl is not exposed to a STEM career, science, technology, engineering, or math, and we can add STEAM or art, by the time she is in the sixth grade, she's not going to choose it. So career intervention programs that start in high school are a tad bit too late to change someone's mind. If they, they've usually decided either I'm good at this or I'm not good at this, I am interested in this, or this is not my cup of tea. And so we have to start early. We start as early as seven years old with hands-on instruction. And you can see in these pictures a variety of our programming. Um, we have our mobile programming, which was launched during the pandemic when we could not be inside. We, we figured out how to take our show on the road <laughs> through our mobile tool lab um, to be able to provide in-community programming. But we also have a workshop in West Charlotte off in the Freedom Avenue area where we are invite Girl Scouts and community members to come in and learn. And so, yes, they're making dream catchers, they're making iPhone holders, but they're using drills and saws to make that happen. And so we take the traditional thought of a craft that they think girls would like, um, but we empower them with tools um, that they can then build literally their future with. So what impacts have we seen in this space? So last summer, we had the opportunity to serve all 14 locations of Mecklenburg County Parks and Rec through a partnership with Sam Met Corporation. And we serve, this number says 150, but at the end, we served over 200 students in Mecklenburg County um, to expose them in this space. And one of the key components of our um, training is, is not just the curriculum or the skill, it's the professional. That's that social capital model. That's the representation matters model of, yes, you're gonna build this toolbox with me. I'm gonna hammer it and I'm gonna nail with you. Then afterwards, I'm gonna tell you that I am a general contractor. I am a site supervisor. I am an engineer. And this is what I do every day for a living. If you're interested, this is the path that I follow in this space. So it is exposing them at this young age to the career, the skill set, and the professional in that career. This is just a drop in the bucket that we want to see exposure because if you don't know it exists, how do you know that you want to pursue it? The next component of what we do, it's the why matters. It matters for girls, it matters for this generation. And what does that mean? If I were to go into a room and say, who wants to learn how to use a drill? Maybe. Maybe a few hands go up, but if I say, who wants to build solar powered hand washing stations to support our homeless neighbors? All hands go up, or at least the majority of the room, because the why you want to build these solar powered hand washing stations. Wonderful. Step one, let's learn how to use a drill. So we switch the focus on the what from the what to the why. Here are some examples of how we get impact. So we believe in training through service. So we partner with local nonprofit organizations for things that they may need done in the community. So to my left here, you see this is the pavilion at Carolina Farm Trust in East Charlotte. Um, we were refinishing um, the pillars there and start helping to remove lights for installation um, and power washing. And so our team, our volunteers, our participants were able to use the skills they learned in our classes to go and serve the community. Let me give you another example. Um, we worked with Providence Day School in 2020. We, um, they had a desire to do little free libraries, um, but with a different spin, they wanted to do little free um, classroom supply stations during the pandemic, realizing that a lot of kids were working from home, may not have the ready supply, paper, pencils, crayons that they needed. And so they worked, they asked us to help them build this. And so we went out there on a Saturday taught the young women how to use the speed square, the drill, the sander, and they built three different little libraries. Fast forward, we get an email last summer from one of the participants, Antonia. They actually started a club called All Hands In, where they wanted to be able to serve the community through the tools that they had used when she built this city. That September, we had an event with Habitat for Humanity building benches 
in the community. And there's Antonia and three of her friends came out um, with the tools that they learned and they built benches to give back to the community. That's what we call a spark ignited. Young women who previously had never used a drill, used a power tool, now understand the power of using and being empowered to use it to serve their community. And now they're able to give back to our neighbors with what they've learned. Next pillar, trades equals technology. When we talk about busting stigmas within construction, typically you think construction is like a, either the shed, my pawpaw's backyard, <laughs> or the, the men on the side of the road um, that are working on commercial construction. And while some of those things may still be true, the future of technology is now. So drones, 3D printing, virtual reality are all technologies that are currently in, um, ingrained in how construction is done. I wanna say Habitat for Humanity out of the Northern Virginia area just 3D printed their first home. And we're talking to companies like Icon out of Texas that can 3D print an affordable home for $10,000. So as our community is thinking about um, affordable housing solutions, we're not going to be able to achieve it using the same mechanisms that we've been using for the past 30, 40 years. 3D printing is a technology that we need to explore if we're going to really talk about impact in our community. Virtual reality, you don't have to travel across the country to see a site if you are a site superintendent with a general contractor. You just take on your, your VRU glasses and you can look around the site from your home. Drones, there's no need to go to the top of a skyscraper to inspect it for safety. You send a drone up there now. So you're no longer needing that technician to go up there. You need a drone operator who is well-versed in how to do that. And you know you can get your drone certification license at 16 years old. These are careers we need to be exposing our young people to now so that they can be the innovators of our future. How are we seeing this work? Um, last summer, we got a grant to um, get about 10 3D printers and we worked with the Level Up program at the YMCA to teach them some of the basics of 3D printing. We're not gonna do it and change it overnight, but what we are showing them is that the trades are changing. And so how we do that is through a simple build. We make an iPhone holder out of wood, two pieces of wood, miter cut, two bolts, um, phone sticks up there with some wood glue. Very simple build, but it's fun. They enjoy it. Now we take that same concept and do it through 3D printing. We talk about customization, size, weight, modeling. And so what with the wood, with minimal skill set, you're able to build a very basic structure. But with 3D printing, here we have this elephant shaped iPhone holder or Android holder, if you will, um, that you're now able to do. So through a very simple, and we printed this in our, um, in our workshop. Um, so with a very simple concept, we're able to show them how construction is changing. If you've tried to order any furniture, if you're currently trying to get a home constructed, you know the price of lumber has increased significantly. So we're really having to rethink this material shortage that we're having and 3D printing is where it's going. And so through a very simple exercise, we're able to show the young people that this is the future of construction. And it's not necessarily about being outside in the sun building, it's about being inside innovating and using your brain to come up with alternative solutions. Our last focus area. And so we've always been focused on helping women in the trades. Again, we know that the pipeline starts early, but COVID put an exponent around the, the timeline for impacting women. We know that COVID disproportionately impacted women, about 2 million less women in the workforce than there were previous to COVID um, because of healthcare, their own health issues, because of that of their aging parents, because of their, their children, virtual schooling. There's so many numbers of reasons, many of the industries that were hardest impact by COVID, like hospitality industry, were um, dominated by women. And so we're seeing that women have not as a whole, especially women of color, haven't quite bounced back, you know, and as we're having the conversation of do we return back to the office, we're seeing more men ready and eager and able to return back to the office than women are. And so we are looking at ways to address that. And we also want to make sure that women have an opportunity to learn a new skill and pay their bills. Oftentimes when we think about upskilling, 
um, in a new trade or profession, you have to sacrifice something, which is to be expected, but we don't want them to have to sacrifice a bill <laughs> for their, their mortgage or their rent to be able to get a new skill. And finally, we need easier access and exposure to careers that are unfamiliar. I would probably say I'm a probably part of the last generation that had um, trades training in school, in the traditional manual. Here in Charlotte, we have a few um, schools like Philip O'Berry that still have trades in schools, but by far and large, trades curriculum is not there. I took wood shop. I made a keychain holder with Mr. Patterson at Jackson Middle School, um, but we have about two generations now that have not gotten that general exposure. So if you're not getting in at school and you don't have a family member who is handy, when are you going to learn it? So we're talking about a job shortage and um, excuse me, um, a employee shortage in the construction um, and people are not signing up. They don't have the basic skill to even think they're qualified to sign up for one of those jobs. When we talk about entry level, entry level in construction is looking at 15 to 18 dollars an hour right now. So she built the city is trying to bridge that gap. How can we take someone who is interested but doesn't have the basic skill set um, and make them qualify for entry level work without um, a lot of time? Because um, women, again, we're already behind. We don't have time to waste. So what can we do in an intensive focus? So this past summer, we launched our first women's trades training program um, in plumbing. So we had a plumbing free apprenticeship um, due to a generous donation from Moen, um, a local women-owned plumber, um, plumbing company, three-way plumbing, and Lowe's, we were able to launch our plumbing free apprenticeship. We had eight women um, participate and graduate from this program. Um, and we are now in our cohort of electricians. So now we have an electrician pre apprenticeship happening in our workshop as we speak in partnership with Enlivian, um, with Duke Energy, as well as um, Rosenden Electric. And so we're able to now say, we're going to give you 15 to 16 weeks of support. Um, you're not going to be an expert, but we're giving you enough so that you are both safe, you're not a hazard to yourself or the work site. You know the basic terminology. You know how you have your OSHA 10 certification, so your safety certification. You have your first aid. Um, you, you can use that drill like a pro so that when you walk onto that site, you are a value add to the site superintendent. So that is a, that's actually a picture of our plumbing cohort. Let's talk about some um, other components of what we do. So talking about the specific issues of women um, or parents, it doesn't have to be just women, parents in general. Um, we offer on-site child supervision, and we're able to now engage in a two-generational approach. I'd like to say that I thought about this from get, but I didn't. We actually happened upon this manner. We were already serving youth, and we had a, a full curriculum of hands-on learning with youth, um, and then we started the adults. Then it wasn't until this last cohort where we said, why are we not doing both programming together? So literally in our workshop, this is from this past Saturday, our electrician cohort is learning CPR. In a separate room, just around the corner in the same building, their children are learning how, are making wooden robots. <laughs> so they're getting their hands on um, the basics of construction. Again, at this young age, we're just sparking interest, um, but they are not going to be, they're going to be natives in this space by the time they finish. Um, good to see you, Rhonda. Um, so we're now talking about two generational approach to upward mobility. You have mom who's getting upskilled, you have child who's becoming exposed to a, a trades pathway that they may not get in school or anywhere else. So we're uh, trying to change the narrative. Not only do we offer on-site child supervision, we also um, pay $100 weekly stipend just to help. Is it gas, gas, <laughs> gas has gone up significantly. So is it just gas getting to the um, community? Is it dinner? Um, is it wh whatever it is, we don't stipulate what it has to be. We do have stipulations on you need to be on time to receive it. You have to be present. You have to um, engage, um, but you use that for whatever you need. So by the time you finish our program, you receive $1,500 to $1,600. That could be a nice um, down payment on something. It could help overcome um, some barrier in your life. And so we're not having asking you to sacrifice your well-being to get upskilled. What are we seeing? We're early. So we're less than a year from having launched this. So, but we already are starting to see examples of success here. On your, on my right here, this is Hatisha. Hatisha is a graduate of Johnson C. Smith University, and she was focusing in healthcare administration. Um, in 2019, she got tired of the corporate um, structure and decided to launch her own 
business, her catering business, Prosperity's Kitchen, but then COVID hit. So she was left, you know, having left corporate America, had started her own business. Um, but now she was in a space where she did not have the ability to pursue that business. Then she learned about our plumbing cohort and she came on to the team to be able to become a master plumber and have a two generational impact for her and her daughter, Gigi. My teacher was so strong in our program, I actually hired her. <laughs> so I'll give you two weeks. <laughs> but now she works as she built this city um, as our youth and community program coordinator. So to my left here, this is Sandra. We met Sandra at a recruiting event at Charlotte Bilingual Preschool. Sandra is a CNA, and we all know that our healthcare workers are tired and feeling underappreciated. Um, she chose to stay um, in, in healthcare and stay as a CNA, but what she was able to do is support her husband's business who has his small business in construction. And now they're able to take on plumbing jobs um, that they were not able to take on before. So she's been able to increase her family's income through, the, through this training program. What else do we have? This is Casey. Um, I like to tell Casey's story because she, she taught us something. Um, Casey, we, we met Casey through a loaves and fishes food distribution. Um, she chose to come to our plumbing program. She was very eager to learn. She did amazing. Um, Casey has a small son um, and was very adamant that she didn't, was not ready to put him in childcare. Um, we were trying to um, encourage her. It's like, hey, Casey, there's so many, so many free resources that can help you put your son in childcare. She wasn't ready. We, um, through a partnership with Google, we got a grant um, to be able to provide both Chromebooks to our participants, as well as um, digital training. So digital literacy training, our program participants become civic technicians. So they learn customer service, they learn problem shooting, um, problem, yeah, troubleshooting, problem solving. And um, so they have additional skill sets. Not only do they have the trades approach, they have customer service skill set. Casey found her own path through her plumbing, training and her digital literacy training and the Chromebook that she's received. Casey has now gotten a job at Electrolux um, and customer service with their dishwasher department virtually. So she's now able to work from home, have the situation that she wants for her family, and she's able to use these skills to advance her family. And I am just so proud of her because she made it work for herself. And that's the ultimate goal of this program is not telling them what to do, is empowering women working mothers with solutions that work best for them. And so I tell this story because Casey told us, <laughs> we were like, come on, Casey, it's a child care, it's okay, look, here's about three different centers. She's like, no, I, I'm not ready yet. And with the resources that she received from us, she was able to find the opportunity that was best for her and her family. I've said a whole lot. <laughs> I think we're about time for questions, um, but how can you invest in She Built This City? Um, of course, financial investment, we're always, looking for support. Um, Lowe's is an underwriting funder of our organization, but we're expanding beyond and having a diversified investment source. You can text United We Spark to 44321 um, as a, a way to give. You can also give on our website. If Marion, could you put that stuff in the chat for me, please? I would appreciate it. Um, if you are in the trades, um, we, we're looking for training partners. So one of the initiatives that I did not speak of that's coming soon is our all women's repair crew. So while our, our pre-apprenticeships and plumbing um, and electrician, those are training only for our all women's repair crew. We're gonna hire those women. So She Built the City is gonna be the employer and we're offering our first apprenticeship. So under us, they will learn um, and they would um, get hands-on experience. And I saw Mr. Crump on the call, if he's still here, he's actually gonna be our instructor, fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> Um, because of his well-versed experience in facilities management. I mean, we're talking to Northwood Ravens apartment management community here in Charlotte. They have nine properties in Charlotte and our ladies will be able to intern under um, their skilled facilities management team because again, there's but so much you can learn in the classroom. You have to have that hands-on experience to become truly well-versed. I mean, finally, you can be if an employer. We're looking for our women to be able to be placed. Um, um, one of our team members in Mecklenburg County said, we're not trying to do the, the train and pray approach. Hope they get a job when they finish. Um, we're doing the train and place. So we, we're looking for direct paths to employers when they finish. So if they don't choose to take a job, it's their choice, not because there was an opportunity available for them. So that is us. That is She Built This City. 
Um, again, it is a privilege and an honor to be here with you all today, and I look forward to engaging. I saw several questions come up in the chat, so I'm going to stop sharing here. And um, Ms. Laura, you lead the way and let me know what our, our next steps should be. Oh, yeah, that was simply beautiful, and it's wonderful to know that you, as a, one of our younger people in Charlotte, is out doing uh, such good work in our community. I'd like to ask, start off with this question. Um, what was the work that Demi Clark was doing uh, that inspired her to do this? She was in construction. She was in construction. She worked at DP, uh, DR Horton, excuse me, um, and she was through a variety of departments, you know, within construction. Um, and she said in whatever room that she was in, she was the only woman and she self acknowledged she at that she was a white woman in those rooms. And so through her experience of being in that space, um, she said, we have to change it. And there's but so many women's ERG meetings you can attend um, or, you know, mentor one on one mentor opportunities you can have um, to have the true impact at the current rate that we are going with women engaged in the trades it would take 99 years to achieve equity in the space. And that's just not acceptable. We, we need equity sooner. And so um, with organizations like She Built This City, we are look, looking to be able to put an exponent behind the rate of change in the industry. But with my background, um, we've added to the mission, um, gender equity is not enough. We need socioeconomic equity. We need race equity in this space as well. Okay, which brings me to my next question is, the name, she built this city. What's the rationale behind that? <laughs> well, I, I was from there, so we built this city. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a catchier answer, but that it came from the, the song. Nobody trademark attorneys in here on the call. I mean, it came from the song. It was, insp it was inspired. It was inspired by the song, um, but with the focus on the role that women play in the work. Um, Women are the foundation. There's an old African proverb. I'm going to not say it correctly, but it talks about when you invest in the woman in the community, you invest in the whole community um, because women take care. They take care of their families. And so when we start with who is building this, is she did it. She built okay. this community. It is the foundation. <laughs> just, just and I will say it's not, at the, it's not at the expense of men. Um, so we're not a women only. Again, Mr. Crump is going to be one of our instructors. Kenny Surratt was our plumbing instructor. We know that it takes male allies to achieve equity. And so we're not a, a women only space. We just realize there's a significant gap in exposure for women. So we do focus our efforts in recruiting that in that space. But we are welcome to all. And we realize that equity is not going to be achieved on the backs of women. It's going to take men in positions of power um, advocating for equity as well to see true change happen. Okay, definitely non traditional, but I uh, love it. Uh, another question is Are you helping to get the plumbers and electricians license through your program? Yes, yes. And so, again, we're still very young. I'll, I'll narrate where we are in the process. And so, for our plumbing pre apprenticeship, we just received, She Built the City just received North Carolina State certification as a pre apprenticeship. So, um, our graduates will receive their certification of going through the program with us, the license part has to come from a master plumber. And that was the connection we didn't have for our plumbing program. So with our electrician program, what we've done is we connected with CETI, Carolina's Electrical Training Institute. They're out of Fort Mill. They're an electrician apprenticeship here. Um, so we are directly using their curriculum and instructors to form a path to their program. And the beautiful thing about this established apprenticeship is that they have all of those mechanisms in place. First year apprentices, so in theory, when our women finish, they, they pass the test in April. April 30th is the date we're, we're pushing for. By June 1, they will be fully employed. Um, first year apprentices, while they're still learning, $30,000 a year, full benefits, um, one pension. By their fourth year, while they're still learning on the job training, they'll be making $65,000 a year Full benefits for them and their family and two pensions. That's stuff you don't hear about anymore. Um, but it's right. foundational in the trades and it's right here. But there's there are networks and conversations that we don't hear about. And I'll tell you now with our women, um, the struggle, they did a pretest and they're already a little scared about the math. This goes back to our sixth graders. <laughs> and so they're they're scared about the algebra. And so we're looking for math tutors and put that out there. 
to help our women overcome some of the concerns they have about the algebra. So we're seeing already now we need to go back, get stronger in those math fundamentals so that we're not excluding ourselves from these very viable options and pathways um, that you don't need a four year degree, but you do need those math basics um, to be able to handle the voltages and the measurements that are needed for this pathway. Okay, thank you. Are you working in conjunctions with the Goodwill Center trainings or can you graduates move to their program, to their programming? So we actually see the opposite. We usually see our graduates, um, our participants from Goodwill usually come to us as their next step. Um, and so they do their construction basics typically from there. And again, Mr. Crump has been in, involved in both of the areas. And they get some of the basics there, but what um, many of our current traditional training pipelines lack is the actual on the job training. And so they'll, they'll get their OSHA. So we usually get them with their OSHA, but they usually don't have the hands on experience needed to actually get the job. And so that's why ours is really focused on the hands on piece because I get knowing, knowing what a drill is, is step one. But if you can't use it safely and effectively, you don't know what your bid is, you don't know how to load it, um, you are not as, you're not job ready, you're not work site ready yet. And so employers have told us, um, again, you don't have to know everything, but I need you not to be a liability when you come on my site. <laughs> so we have to be able to make sure that they have those basic fundamentals down. Are you working with the local community colleges at all? We are in conversations. And so right now, CPCC um, has been a, an amazing partner Based mostly in employer connections. So we're able to work with their, um, I want to say it's Harris campus. So you can correct me if I'm wrong or Harper, Harper campus that focuses on trades. I um, mean, so they have a, a extensive network of employer connections. Um, our Hatisha, who I mentioned in our, in our um, training video, she had a ride along with all about the pipes plumbing um, because of CPCC. We've gotten several of our employer connections from CPCC. We're still working on a, a student connection, but one of the things that, and why we're pursuing our North Carolina apprenticeship certificate certification is because if they are, if we become a North Carolina apprenticeship, um, they can take classes for free at CPCC. They're able to go through that program. And so we're trying to bridge that gap there. So after they do the basic trades component, they're able to pursue higher education should they choose for construction management. Um, because I know there was a question about licensure here in North Carolina to do basic handy work, you know, so the, the, the handy person that comes to your home, you don't have to be licensed, but there's a certain level in, of bonding that you would need if you wanted to then become a plumber on your own. And so we're trying to get you to enough to know that you want to be there, but from there, we have to pass you on to the CPCC or the apprenticeship to get that final certification. Okay, now I'm just, I'm just you just spoke in regards to this question, but I'm just going to ask it. See mm -hmm. if you need to uh, reiterate what you've already said. Is there a pipeline or are there any other pipelines that will assist with career placement other than CPCC or what you guys are doing? So there are a few existing. So like CPCC, um, Goodwill, the Urban League. Um, what we're trying to do though is we're trying to create new paths. Um, I was trying to come up with a better metaphor. My, my brain stalled on me. But we're working with like in Livy and Renaissance West, we actually do door to door recruiting because again, because trades were not exposed in school, if you don't have someone in the family, there's a, maybe 20% of the population who sees a flyer that says, oh yeah, that's me. I want to do that. The other, you know, people may not consider, but there's, there's maybe another 30 to 40% that would consider it if someone had a conversation with them about what it would be like to be in the trades. So we're going after that demographic because our employer partners are telling us we're, we're advertising these jobs. We are paying well above, you know, $15 an hour. There's no one is applying for the jobs. And there's a few reasons. And one of them is there's a whole workforce that doesn't know that they're qualified or could be qualified for that. And so we're, we're docking on doors. We literally have a canvasser <laughs> who goes for our partnership with Livian. And when they're coming out, kids are getting off the bus. Here, we're going to do a youth build. Let's go build some um, iPhone holders. And when mom and dad come, did you know we're going to do this electrician training? Let me tell you about it. <laughs> so that you, did you know that this was a viable pathway for a career? And we're Toya. saying, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this, <laughs> how you doing? It's so good to see your face. Let me turn on my camera. Dan, Danielle with the Urban League, how are you? 
Hi, Daniel, how are you Daniel, doing? Excuse me, excuse me, Danielle. We, uh, I don't know if you, are you here for the first time? Oh, no, ma'am, I'm sorry. I'll put it in the chat, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> one of the questions is, are you a partner with the ROC, Darren Ash, and I'm not familiar with that. The Rock. So they are a program, again, doing great work with high schoolers um, in the area. And if anyone knows more about the program, feel, please feel free to correct me. Um, we've had conversations with Darren and what we um, what we would like to see is his participants be teachers for our younger ones um, in that space. Um, because, again, he's well established, well established curriculum. But again, it's who is self selecting into that program is what our concern is, is we're trying to make a pipeline of middle schoolers who are more eager and ready to go to the rock because now they've been exposed a little bit earlier to the program. And so we are aware, I mean, we're working on how we support that program by building a greater groundswell of young people who want to be in trades so that they are pursuing and choosing programs like the rock. Okay. Uh, if <laughs> I'm going to read this, this is from Steve. It says to everyone, <laughs> if it's not caffeine, what fuels your personal focus on a problem that dozens of silos, nonprofits have failed to eliminate? Help us to wow. understand that. That's a good one. It's great, Steve. <laughs> can you can so you address not caffeine, that? Caffeine. What is it? Us. Um. So, um, it's not caffeine. I don't drink coffee. I do like a chai. I do like a chai tea though, on occasion. Um. It's going back to my classroom, and so I didn't I didn't go too deep into how I got here, um, but within the four walls of my classroom, I realized that teachers, what we do in the classroom is valuable, but it's not enough to change the narrative. I left there, um, and I was came to actually Charlotte to work with citizen schools. Those of you who've been around for a while may know that organization. We were focused on extended learning time, and so I, my first job here in Charlotte was at Martin Luther King Middle School. And we did the extended learning time program. So we brought, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Siemens Energy into the classroom to realize, um, help them be exposed. I thought at that time that was a silver bullet. I thought exposing, you know, middle schoolers to careers and people was the answer to changing. But seeing how many of our kids were homeless and had to drop out of the program because of lack of transportation, I then was like, well, this isn't it either. It's the parents. It's the families. Like if we don't, if we don't empower the community at large with affordable housing, workforce development, healthy living opportunities, no intervention that we do within a school system for youth is going to be sufficient. And so then is when I step back. I, I have an MBA, but also a background in education. I had to choose between education and business, and I, I did a sharp left to business when I realized that it wasn't going to be within the classroom that we were going to see the changes and I began to learn about the community development needs. And so what, what drives what um, drives me, Steve, is the realize, realization that I truly believe the trades is a pathway to upward mobility that can end generational poverty. Like, I, like I feel like I found my answer. I'm sure there's other layers <laughs> to it, um, but I feel as if like this is why I left my classroom 20 years ago. I, I see it. Um, I've been a part of other apprenticeship programs, and so coding, coding at one time, people were saying, oh, yeah, we can get them some you know, boot camps and coding. I still believe that's a, a viable pathway. There's a smaller um, population who is really, really realistically going to excel in coding. And so I see with the trades, especially during the pandemic, you know, what didn't stop construction. <laughs> All right, that's right. <laughs> And um, again, having been, I'm, I'm only 10 years in Charlotte, so I do not consider myself you know, an expert in any way, but I do believe we're not gonna build our way out of this affordable housing crisis. You have to pay people, <laughs> you know, um, live, increasing living wages um, to be able to sustain them in this space so they can, they can live in those not so affordable quotation mark spaces. Um, and I'll throw this in here because Steve asked. Um, another thing that we're looking at is how much we're paying people. We have some programs that are looking at, you know, $14, $15, $15, even $16 an hour, which are great wages. If you if you look at them outside of the price of rent here in Charlotte, um, we're, we're now talking about the benefits cliff, where uh, someone who is seeking a better life for themselves and their family has to decide, should I take this $16 hour, a $16 hour job 
um, and lose the support services that I have for childcare, which is crazy expensive, or do I go back to this $10 an hour job where I still have full benefits and my, my children are in free daycare? If we're not looking at $18, $19 an hour, we're not changing the narrative. We're just repeating the cycle. And so those are some of those hard questions that we're going to have to ask ourselves and really look at how are we going to change the story for a family. It's not that they don't want to. I can't speak for it all. But a mama wants to take care of her children, you know. But if it doesn't make sense, I'm going to stay at this, you know, hair cedar, checking out groceries because I still get benefits. Yes, that opportunity looks nice, but I'm going to lose my benefits if I do that. So I'm going to stay here. If we're not having these conversations, we're not going to change it. We're just going to keep repeating the cycle, wondering why it's not working. So see, that's why. <laughs> that's what fuels me because I feel like we're really close to a, a strong, viable solution that can impact communities. And so I, I push. I, I push for it because I think we're really close to an answer. Okay. Are you connected with the county's workforce development efforts? I am getting connected. Um, I've been able to have conversations with um, Anthony Trotman and a few in his department. Actually, meet with them tomorrow. So, if you know anybody, put in a good word for me <laughs> um, to begin those conversations. Because we're we're young. You know, we were founded in 2019, but I bring 20 years of experience in nonprofit. Where Demi had the 20 in construction, I have 20 in nonprofit and community development. I mean, so with our powers combined, I feel like Captain uh, Captain Planet, um, <laughs> we're able to bring our solutions to the table. I haven't spoken about Marion, who's on the call and her background. Marion, do you mind sharing a little bit about your how, how you came to shape up the city and why you feel like this is a space for advancement? Yeah, th thank you, Latoya. So, hi, everybody. Marion, excuse me. Before you oh, talk, I think yeah. that Shante has to leave, but she has a question in reference okay. to. Uh, some of those that live outside, that live in Concord that she's mentoring and wanted to know if there are restrictions uh, for where they live in order to participate in your program. So for our current programming and our current funding sources, there is no restriction. Um, again, Lowe's, um, there's a few corporate sponsors and, and I'll put a little plug here. We found the most liberation from getting corporate sponsors outside of foundations and grants because there's not as many restrictions on what we can do. Um, but we are looking to, because yes, they could participate, but still there's that transportation barrier. We are looking to, to expand into Cabarrus, Iredale and Rowan counties. Um, we're exploring that this year. Um, to see what we can do to, to serve those communities as well. Because again, once we figure out the right formula, it's easily replicable if you have the right partners at the table. So we're, we're, we're yes, they're open, um, but we are looking at how we can go to their communities to, to serve. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, thank you for allowing me. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Marion, if you can go ahead and speak now. No problem, Laura. Thank you. Um, I'm Marion Poles. I'm the corporate partnership manager for She Built the City. Um, I came on board with the organization late last year. Um, I actually um, came from a family who um, my grandfather was a retired glazer. My mother was in the window and door industry her entire career up until recently. Um, and I went I went to college thinking I was going to be an educator. I wanted to be a high school Spanish teacher and learned very quickly that that wasn't my path. Um, and so I became, when I graduated um, from the University of Northern Iowa, I became a CASA volunteer, which is a child advocacy program. I mean, I was absolutely obsessed with what I was doing. It was, it was hard work, but it was really engaging and I loved what I was doing. I mean, I decided I wanted to pursue my education further so that I could then enter into the nonprofit space in some shape, form, or fashion. Um, I mean, I grew up in a Habitat for Humanity home. So I've been, I, we, our family has been helped by many. So I wanted to give back, but through my career. So I um, then pursued my master's degree at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, actually, I was born in Las Vegas, so my, and my grandparents still live there. So shifted to the West Coast for that. Um, graduated uh, in public administration and nonprofit management. Um, so I was all gun ho to enter into the nonprofit space um, and then was awful in every interview I went on and um, needed to pay rent. So lo and behold, I went and worked at Pella Windows and Doors with my mother. So have been in the land of windows and doors ever since um, in some shape, um, 
you know, I was a, a sales representative. I worked, uh, Lowe's was my account with Pella. I moved on to Lowe's as a district manager for installed sales in Virginia. Um, and then also ran a crew uh, for a window and door installation company here in Charlotte. So I've been in every aspect of windows and doors, um, but soon, and then was introduced to LaToya through that organization. And we were going to partner um, in a different capacity through my company. Um, but then I just fell in love. I absolutely fell in love with the mission of She Built This City. It kind of put my two passions together of home improvement and nonprofit. Um, and so I literally told Latoya, I want to give you all of my time um, and energy. And she was excited to bring me on board. So I recently uh, left the installation company to come on board to join forces with Latoya um, and, and merge what I've been doing. So it's, it's very interesting how we've all kind of come to this path, but it's it's worth it because um, the difference that we are that we are making in the Charlotte community and as we grow and expand into other into other areas, um, I I'm gonna make comment. I would love to figure out how we can partner with girls from Concord. I live right here in Concord, so um, I would love to make that connection. Okay, uh, hopefully Shante will get that information. Awesome. Okay, another question we have. Thank you, Marion. Why do students have to access these programs outside of the school system? Why not teach it to them while they are there so they can be ready um, for their absolutely to go into these industries? Absolutely. I'll give I'll give a two-layered approach. Um, I think you're asking an excellent question. Um, the trades were taken out of the schools in the 70s. Um, people could give you a number of reasons why, um, but the practical, I would, Latoya's theory is cost. You know, it the machinery and space that it takes to do adequate trades training education versus putting 20 seats in a classroom. Um, school systems make decisions. And so it was taken out, I would say, for the wrong reasons. And we've seen the impact of that in both rural communities and minority communities. Um, if you look at, again, check me, fact check me, y'all, but every successful black community, you know, in the 70s, you know, early, you know, post slavery, the yeah. center core of wealth was in the trades. You know, they were electricians, they were plumbers. And yeah. so when trades training was taken out of schools, it impacted rural and minority communities the most. Um, so we are trying to change the narrative of what that looks like. Um, why has she built this city gone outside of the school system? The very practical reason we were launched during COVID and we couldn't get in. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we, we went to YMCA's, you know, communities and schools, neighborhood associations, because we couldn't, literally couldn't get into a school um, during the time. Um, we are just now being able to re-engage with the school system, but I would say that it's still through community partnership. So through um, the library, CMS library, shout out to Clay from the outreach department. We've worked with Berry Hill Middle School. We've worked with West Mech. Um, but it has been through the communities and schools and, and library connections. And so we're still trying to navigate the school system and what does it mean to come inside? And we would love to go deeper in the school system. So that was like a macro and micro <laughs> big picture, you know, why you was taken out of the schools and then why she but the city haven't been in schools. We're just starting our path within schools here. And just to make a statement, because that's what was asked of mirrors is that most of the expert tradesmen do not have a college degree. And there has been a hindrance for CMS to allow them to come in and assist in the school system. So you go, we our prayers are with you on continuing to work on that uh, with the school Thank system. Um, let's see. I'm looking for other questions. There are some nice comments uh, and people that are willing to assist. And um, we, are, we are very pleased with your presentation and just to know that you're out there doing something that's so, it's, it's non-traditional um, with our students, especially with young ladies. And I think that if we continue to, if you continue to do this, it's gotta grow. We, we've had it, we've had a, problem, I will say, in Mecklenburg County in introducing new programs like this into Charlotte Mecklenburg schools and for any efforts uh, that you put in that, I would, you know, just ask you to continue 
to do that because it is it's of vital importance that 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 this happens now with um with charlotte mecklenburg schools as well as our open community i want to once again thank you and your staff for coming on and and tell demi we did miss her <laughs> not being here with us but we know that you all are doing a wonderful job and we'd like for you to keep it up and visit with us on tuesday morning forum and send any announcements that you have of some of the programs that you have open to steve and he will he will make a note of it and put it on our website sarah stevenson's uh, Tuesday Forum's website. But once again, we, we appreciate your presentation um, and invite you to come back again. And at this time, you can, of, of all of this information, and for everyone who's not aware of it, you know, these presentations can be viewed on the website, uh, the Sarah Stevenson Tuesday morning website with the chat uh, information that's involved because a lot of people have out have outreached to you this morning by way of chat and want to work with you in some, at some level. So with that being said, once again, thanks. And we'd like to ask uh, those that are, we'd like to recognize our elected officials that's with us this morning. And I know Thelma is here, Jennifer is here. And as I call your name, if you can, Chris uh, is, is appointed, but he's running for office, but we want him to first share his appointment and then uh let me see Bilal is in office now uh, so that being said i like to ask uh starting with them good you... morning everyone i am so excited to be here and to hear what uh, she is doing for the for the citizens and and uh, I pointed out in the chat, but I just want to lift up uh, the fact that uh, Susan Gant Car uh, Carroll is our CTE director for CMS, and she is in charge of putting all of that, those types of courses in our schools. I really like the fact that you're saying we have to touch our elementary kids first in order to just let them know that they, this is something they can be excited about. Um, so, but anyway, I'm on the school board. I'm vice chair and I'm running for re-election and I'm okay. excited to be able to continue to find things like this to make sure that our students have everything they need to be successful in life. Thank you. Okay. Let us in school board. Uh, Jennifer. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer De La Hara. I currently serve at large on the school board, and I want to echo what Vice Chair Bias Bailey said, and also what Susan um, Gant Carroll said in the chat. You know, we are reliant upon bonds um, to develop the programming. We are her, currently have some construction going on at Olympic to expand our six different CTE programs, and so we will be putting a bond, hopefully, on the ballot in 2023 that will include some expansion of um, trades programming and so we would appreciate the community support um, to make that happen because we have to work in conjunction with the county um, to make that happen and also advocacy around teacher pay there's an education um, um, subcommittee from the state that's going around right now i know they're going to hold hearings in gaston and union county we're fighting to have one in here in mecklenburg county because it is challenging as susan gann put in the in the chat to find an electrician who could make eighty, a hundred thousand dollars a year, and ask them to come and teach our students and offer them forty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> so there are multiple okay. challenges that we face, and we certainly welcome the advocacy at the state level um, to find real solutions for how we can assist to increase the programming that I think we all agree we need. Thank you so much, uh, Latoya, for being here. I do want to point out, in case you recognize my last name, my husband Jorge actually runs. The Generation T program at Lowe's. And so we chatted about you last night when I saw you were coming, and he appreciates all the work that you're doing in partnership with Lowe's. Um, okay. Okay, we're going to move oh, on. Oh, I'm sorry. To... Let me just say I'm also running for county commissioner at large, and I'll drop my information in the chat. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Matt, yeah, I'm one of our elected officials. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great presentation, Latoya. Thanks for all you do. I am Matt Newton. I serve you on the Charlotte City Council representing District 5, and I'm running for District Court Judge this year, seat 16. I'll put my information in the chat. It's always great to be with you. Thank you. Now, do we have any other elected officials that I have not rec recognized? 
Okay, then we will go to those that are candidates. Uh, I'm going to start with Trevor. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Laura, and what a terrific program. Um, I'm the one that asked the question about um, whether LaToya and her group are connected with the county. I'm glad she's meeting with Anthony Trotman. Um, I think this is a perfect thing for the county to be involved in funding because I think she's right on the pulse of where we're going to get improvement in economic opportunity is getting people involved in the trades and especially as sparking children, uh, young girls to do this. Uh, I, I'm really supportive of this program. Uh, anyway, uh, my name is Trevor Fuller. I served you as a county commissioner at large uh, for four terms. Uh, and as chairman of the county commission, I was a candidate for the North Carolina State Senate before these legislators in Raleigh decided to change the lines and have eliminated the district that uh, originally was an open seat district. And now they have realigned such that that district does not any longer exist. Um, and uh, I've chosen not to uh, run against any one of the incumbents. Uh, my precinct is in uh, Senator uh, DeAndrea Salvador's district, and I've chosen not to run against her. So I am no longer a candidate for the North Carolina oh. State Senate in this cycle. All right. But I thank, thank you for your support, nevertheless. Arthur Griffin. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm still on grandparent duty, um, so I'm calling you from my car. I really enjoyed the uh, presentation. Uh, for some of you that may not know it, uh, as I chaired the school board, we created a school, not only created a school, but we built a school that was specifically designed called Philip O'Berry for the trades, the building trades, for electricians, for automotive mechanics. But leadership decided to change that program. And so I'm very familiar with the process. I think my experience uh, will help us as I run for an at-large seat on the Mecklenburg County Board of County Commission because I know a little bit of something about the building trade as well as trying to work with the community college system because I sit as a trustee and I can tell you, and I've gone through the welding program, so I can tell you what the needs are. She indicated that youngsters trying to pass the electrician's test has a problem with basic mathematics. So I would love to uh, speak longer but I'm running as a candidate, would appreciate your consideration and your vote. Thank you. Okay, Chris, uh, Basil, I apologize for missing you. As a, uh, already Don't worry about it, man. I'm happy to go with the candidates and thank you for giving me any time. Okay. Um, my name is Chris Basil. I'm a Mecklenburg County Magistrate and I am running for District Court Seat 1, the seat recently held by Judge Kimberly Best before her appointment to the Superior Court. And I'll put my information in the chat, but I want to say thank you to LaToya. This is a wonderful program. Um, and thank you for focusing on getting people at all generations involved and on new trades and skills coming through. That's wonderful. Okay, Monty, Dr. Monty Witherspoon. Uh, this is Dr. Monty Witherspoon. I'm, uh, we'll be following around for school board district. Too. I echo the sentiments of uh, everyone before. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It's exactly what uh, uh, my candidacy is uh, based on uh, providing these uh, sorts of opportunities. Look forward to speaking to everyone and in the near future. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, does uh, Fleet, I mean, Jennifer Fleet. <laughs> Listen, if you want to speak that into existence, that's fine by me. I don't mind. Uh, my name is Jennifer Fleet. I'm running for district court judge seat number 15. I'll put my information in the chat. As always, I enjoy the group and the fellowship and the information. I will tell you, um, LaToya, I did construction to get through undergrad. I learned it as, a, as an apprentice, uh, and that's many, many, many years ago. Um, it supplemented as a kid going to college early with no financial aid, no family, you know, whatever. But what's What's even better is over the next 30 some odd years, how I have relied on that. When I became a single mom, I could fix my own stuff when I didn't have money. When, you know, it was the sense of empowerment that I didn't have to rely on people that was more than what I could do with my hands. 
And that I think is something that people need to recognize when you teach a young person, man or woman to do something with their hands, man, you empower them for life. So I appreciate you and what you're doing. I'll put my information in the chat. Just want to give my two cents. Have a wonderful day and thank you so much as always. Okay, Bilal. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much um, for having me. And as and as always, an excellent uh, an excellent forum this morning. I wanted to echo what Jennifer said as well as as far as empowerment, but also just the importance of having all these different parts of the government. You know, we've got school board, county commission, judicial. Uh, I think it's great that we're really all coming together and learning in ways that can help uh, in all these different areas. But I am running for district court judge for seat 19, uh, the seat currently held by Judge Hewitt. Is she stepping down at the end of her term? I am an experienced trial attorney, dedicated public servant, and Charlotte native. Um, I currently serve you at the public defender's office as an attorney representing sure, yeah. people in district and superior court. And before that, I was in private practice uh, helping families in family court, juvenile court, civil and criminal, and also serve you. Um, as an attorney in the Army Reserves, I will put my information in the chat. I hope to earn your support and thanks again. And it's great to see everybody. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Lupke and I'm running for city council at large. Uh, Latoya, thank you so much for the, the presentation. Um, I'm the one who asked the question about community colleges because the trades are so important and so many in our community think that they have to go to a four year university and like the trades are the key to economic mobility in our city. So I really appreciate it, love what you're doing and I'll put my information in the chat as well. Thank you. Okay, and last but not least, but Tim. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I'm not on camera driving to a meeting. Um, Latoya, thank you for the work you do and I really appreciate your problem solver uh, attitude. Um, I'm Tim Emery. I'm a criminal defense attorney who is seeking to serve this community as the district attorney. We are, our campaign is focused on transforming a criminal punishment system into a actual justice system. And I look forward to getting to know all of you better as we approach uh, May 17th. Thank you. Okay, and Joyce uh, Waddell has, uh, um, has come on as well. She's one of our elected officials. Joyce, you want to? Did you want to share? Okay. Well, we'd like to thank you again, uh, Latoya, and uh, invite you again to yeah. come back and be with us. On I want to. I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for what you've been doing. I'm. I continue to be impressed with what's going on with Tuesday morning forums, Sarah Stevenson Forum. I'm Joyce Waddell, and I've been serving you in the North Carolina General Assembly Senate. 40. I'll be running for my fifth term, and yesterday we filed as a delegation at the North Carol at the State Board of Elections right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I look forward to serving you. So I'll continue to be working for you in Senate District 40, Joyce Waddell. Okay, and I'd just like to just mention that. Kim Ratliff is always with us on Tuesday mornings as well, uh, representing um, Congresswoman Emma Adams. So just as, as uh, did you want to say anything, uh, Kim? Just want to say good morning. I enjoyed the presentation on She Built This City. And of course, Congresswoman Emma Adams filed on Friday for re-election to District 12 for U.S. Congress. So keep her in mind and give her your vote. Thank you. Okay, uh, Yvette, I think is on and she'd like to probably represent someone. Like, are you still with us, Yvette? Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna have to go back and, um, and rewind and, and look at the, I'm just doing double duty, but I enjoyed the portion of the forum that I was able to listen into. I and mean, I'm so excited about um, what's happening for our little people and uh, younger people. And the fact that she mentioned wraparound services. Um, like as my, my comment said, I'm here to represent Ms. Lawana Mayfield, who is running at large for city council. Um, Lawana is, like I said, one of the women who helped build this city. She was on city council representing district three for several years, and she's back um, running for at large. And she is really one of the most knowledgeable people that I know, um, particularly about matters of the city. And she helps small business owners such as myself. So thank you so much, you all. Good morning. 
Here. If it's okay, I can mention something. I know I mentioned it here a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to give an education update to anyone on this call and anyone in the public. Um, I think it's March 14th. If folks are interested, let me know because I could bring in some information um, about the various trades programs that are at the different schools across the county. Um, and that could be part of it. So do let me know if you're planning to come. I'll drop it in the chat. Um, but that would be a good sort of overview and could be part of the conversation about what programs do exist and uh, 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 the expansion plans for CMS. Well, yeah, this is Dr. Yo. Nice to meet you. I'm in the partnership office at CMS and we work with your program with Felicia. Yes. Throughout the uh, summer and you all were so gracious to serve as one of our remote learning sites and offer programs for some of our students. So if there's a way that you would like to continue the partnership aspect in our new movement going forward, please, um, I'll put my email in the chat, let us know, and we can continue to uh, serve students in that capacity. Thank you so much. Absolutely, I'll reach out. So let me ask you, Latoya, what are some of the uh, long term goals that you built this city? Where are, are there? Uh, do you have markers where you would like to be in the next 10 years? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, where do I even want to begin? I'll start. I'll start small with um, our desires for our cohorts. So, of course, we want to see um, at least 80% of our graduates from our pre apprenticeships enroll in the apprenticeship program or receive entry level jobs. Um, for our women's repair crew, though, we're hiring um, for two years, but we're not hiring to keep them. Um, we want to see at least 60% go out and either join another um, company or um, start their own business. And so what I did not discuss is our desire to see women-owned businesses um, come out of this. And so focusing on entrepreneurship pathways, um, that's another I would say one distinguishing factor between us and some of our other partner programs that are doing trades training is that you are usually training to a corporation. Um, we realize with the handiwork, especially there's a, a pathway to entrepreneurship um, that can either be a side gig, as um, Ms. Fleet noted, you know, can help you through hard times or it could be your main gig because I know my personal um, repair person charges $125 an hour <laughs> to come do some things around the house. So that there's a viable pathway for um, someone who is looking for flexibility in their schedule. And um, then also, Ms. Fleet noted, you know, the niche that we have here, um, think about your domestic violence survivors and the comfort they would have of having an all woman crew or a woman coming in their home, single mother, just the, the, the space there. And so we are exploring what does it look like to launch an entrepreneurship program there. Um, and is that Winston? Is that Winston? Um, yes. <laughs> Your name disappeared for a second. Um, so that is some of the micro, you know, conversations that we're having. We're talking to corporations like Semet. So yes, we can get you through the trades training. Then we have entrepreneurship training, but still entering into the construction space is very capital heavy. So looking at Aspire Community Capital, get some seed investment funding for these small businesses, helping them get their first truck or whatever it looks like. But then you have corporations, big corporations like Semet. Um, who have um, mentorship programs. And so they take other small businesses that they can go alongside them. So they get to learn along Sam Matt how to do a project. So you get to use Sam Matt's estimating tools. You get to see how Sam Matt takes on projects. So we're looking to expand programs like that. So yes, in one level, we're looking at more employees in the space, but we're looking seriously at the entrepreneurship pipeline and then how she built the city can then be a network a women owned businesses in construction. So maybe we're able to help you scale. We're able to help you um, with your HR and your finance components because not everyone who chooses to be in the trades is also a business professional. So what can we do to empower a community of women? Also, Winston, we're looking at an app. So just like um, doctors have decision support systems when someone comes in and says, you know, my, my throat's scratchy, my head hurts, <laughs> other than COVID, it's pre-COVID, everything's COVID now. But like now, like you can put your symptoms in and um, they can give you a few choices. We want our women to be empowered, you know, going into homes and say, all right, it's the leaky faucet, but it's leaking out, you know, pipe B. 
what are my options to fix it? So we're looking at decision support systems at a front facing for our ladies. But then we're also looking at a social co connection. So, hey, red alert, I'm at a home. This man is acting crazy. Is anybody in the neighborhood? Because <laughs> there's some very realistic safety concerns that women have when they go into this space. So like, how can we develop a, a network for women, both in person and virtually? In person. In person. Those are some of the, like, the, the big things that we're looking at long term we want to see equity in the space in a, a um you say equity 50 50. so 50 50 percent of women in the trades currently we're looking at 13 percent um and then we're also looking at ownership ratios for women black and minority owned women um businesses greater specifically in mecklenburg county to see that number increase are you also looking <laughs> Victoria, are you also looking to help them become subcontractors to some of the CMS and other uh, op building opportunities? We have minority owned businesses that qualify as small business and they're having million dollar, um, you know, bottom lines. That to me doesn't sound like small business, but and I guess in the world of contracting, that's small. But uh, I would love to see some of those women to elevate to that point. That is a part of our, so I know Winston, you asked like 10 year, five, 10 year goal. That would be our desire to see. So if we can get you the basics of trades, get your entrepreneurship, learn, mentor under some of established corporations that are willing to share a piece of the pie. And I think that's where we have to hit in some of the cultural components that we're not going to change the narrative without allyship. So who's willing to share a piece of their pie to let a, a minority woman owned business come and learn under them and then go and compete in the space. There's enough for everybody to succeed in, in construction, especially. Um, so how do we change that dynamic? And so that is a, a more longer term approach that we know is going to take time um, and uh, capital investments from people stepping back and saying, hey, we will do some sort of like sharp tank angle, angel investor opportunities for, for women in the space. I know so Robert Robert Hillman came on. You want to give him a shout out, Robert? Mm, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have a little bit of trouble with my uh, audio, uh, but I'm um, excuse me, that's not my audio, my video. I'm not sure what's going on. But hi, Rob Hillman, um, candidate for City Council District Six. Um, I will put my information in the chat. I was just really coming in. I was at a meeting, so I'm just really catching up on this uh, discussion. It's a really an interesting discussion. Um, I will put my information in the chat. And uh, yeah. thank you, Doctor uh, Sylvia has, uh, has her hand up. Thank you so much, Miss Laura Latoya. Great presentation. Thank you so much for this. I'm very much interested in learning out uh, a little bit more about those $10,000 affordable homes <laughs> through 3D printing. We, we certainly need a lot more of that in, in Charlotte and looking at ways to do, do that. I do a lot with the Cherry Community Organization. And as you know, in this city, we just have such a, a need for affordable housing and finding a way to make that work. Um, also, as we look at maintenance crews for some of our properties, um, looking at she built this city to do some of those things as well. Um, we have an 82 unit in Livian complex here. So partnering with them to do some things and we're embarking upon Morgan school um, and doing some creative programming there and looking at STEM with the new innovation district with atrium health. Um, trying to connect you all to that. And so um, Miss Delahara and Miss Byers Bailey can tell you how we're kind of our wheels are turning with that as well. Um, so thanks so much for that. The other thing is, I just want to bring up to you all, um, if you haven't done so already, please put your eyes on the 2040 policy map that the city will be adopting. If communities have not looked at it, we just need communities to put their eyes on it. It's going to make a difference in how Charlotte does business. Um, and the city had the public hearing on last night. It's going to be adopted on March, I think, 28th, unless we can get them to delay it. And a lot of communities just have never seen the map, know nothing about the map, don't know anything about how the map is going to work. It connects with the comp plan and also the UDO, which is called the Unified Development Ordinance. So we know we had the city come out to the Sarah Stevenson Forum. Um, but if you don't know how that's going to affect your communities, we're asking you to please do so. Take a look at it, learn how to navigate it, 
If you need any help, reach out to me. We really are trying to lead communities through this because so many communities have never seen this map and it's gonna make a difference in how our communities will look once it's adopted. So thanks so much for that, Ms. Laura. Mm -hmm. Thank you.